happen. Now, I realized I forgot something, and so if you are a child, uh, kindergarten through sixth grade, we have children's church today, so if you guys can come on up and you guys can head out that door and have fun. All right. Hey, so we have been... Um, we have been in our sermon series, Rediscovering Awe, and we're in week number five, and we've been talking about this basic idea that the ushers want to have an offering. <laughs> I just got away from the ushers. So I forgot to do an offering. Hey, let's do this today. Um, let's take the offering uh, after communion. Can we do that today? Yeah, let's do it after all. Let's do that today, because I... Um, I just forgot to do an offering. So we'll do that um, after two songs at the end of the service during communion. Sorry about that. Um, well, I guess if we pass the offering, it will help you guys all stay awake because you don't want to fall asleep when the offering is passed to you. But anyways, here we go. Um, we've been in this series called Rediscovering Awe, and we've been looking at this idea that when God created the heavens and the earth, he created something absolutely spectacular. And as we look around, as we live our lives, there's opportunities to be in awe all the time. And I know for me, one of the things that I have been doing in this series, I've, when I wake up in the morning, I say, God, um, help me to be in awe of you today. And it's interesting when you do that, um, a lot of the normal things in my life, the things that I have began to take for granted, become things of awe. Do you know what I mean? Can you relate to that? Is anybody else experiencing more awe right now? Are you waking up and saying, God, help me to see the beauty of all that you've done? If you were, um, how many of you were up at about 7.30 this morning? Hands? How many of you went outside at 7.30? It was absolutely beautiful, wasn't it? The sun came through, everything was wet, it was like sparkly, it was just the, the glory of God this morning at 7.30, but then around, it started to look nice, but then around at 9 o'clock it all started to go south, and all the clouds came. Um, but if you were up Thursday evening, uh, Thursday evening, did you see the sunset Thursday evening? It was spectacular. Check this out. Here is the sunset behind our church, and with our projector, that's not very good. It only looks okay. But the real thing um, was absolutely amazing. Now, as we've been talking about awe and this idea of awe, awe is one of those things and one of those emotions that we can easily begin to lose. And if you hear a couple weeks ago, my wife preached and she talked about awe under attack and the idea that sometimes there's things that happen externally, sometimes there's things that happen internally, but there are all sorts of things in this world seeking to rob us of our awe. And last week, we saw the huge problem. If your awe becomes less, or when your awe becomes diminished, do you remember what the Israelites did at the base of the mountain? They made that giant golden idol. And when our awe of God becomes less, we begin to put idols up in our life. Now, of course, when the idols pop up, we have to deal with them, right? The first thing we need to do is notice we have these idols. And when you notice an idol, you can say, God, hey, thank you for showing me this idol. And God, will you forgive me for this idol? And then we take steps to remove those idols from our lives. We make decisions. Say, God, I'm going to try not to worship this thing anymore. God, I'm going to go get help to remove this idol from my life. And we do the things that we need to do. But at the end of the day, whenever we smash idols, if we're not careful, new idols are simply going to grow up in their place or in other places in our lives too. And to really get rid of our idols, we must replant something that's absolutely beautiful, something that is so strong, right? Have grass that is so green that the weeds can't come out. And so this morning what I want to do is talk about what is that something that we, begin, that we can plant in our lives that will keep the idols from popping up. And that something, I'll just tell you on the front end of the sermon, just in case you are going to sleep, I don't want you to miss this. If you hear it as if, if you don't want idols to keep popping up in your lives, here's what you need to do. You need to know 
the grace of God. Now, when I say that, I'm not just talking about knowing the grace of your God in your head, like as a concept or something to simply think about. I'm talking about knowing the grace of God in your heart. Knowing the grace of God personally, right? Not just knowing about it, but knowing it personally. It's like this. How many years ago did we meet, honey? 10? 11? Uh (laughs) Uh-oh. You don't know either. Wonderful. 2005. We met in 2000. We've met 11, we've known each other 11 years. Okay, so when I first saw Amanda, she was working at the coffee shop, and I noticed her, and then I asked my friends about her, and I learned that she worked at another covenant church. She, was a, she worked with a college ministry, and I knew all these things about her, but then one day I decided to take her out for dinner, and at that dinner we sat and we talked for four hours, Right? That's the difference between knowing about her and knowing her personally. And when we think about God and we think about grace, it's the same thing, right? The problem is, in churches, we talk about grace all, all the time. It's a word, if you've been in Christian circles, we always talk about grace. But until grace moves from here to an experience of here, we will never get what Jesus is really about. So this morning, what I want to do is take you through one of my favorite stories in Scripture. And in this particular story, we're going to see the grace of God play out in the life of a woman, and we're going to see what it looks like when it's not only here, but it's here. And we're going to see how this radical grace changes everything about her. Does that sound good? You ready? All right, so here's the deal. If you have a Bible, we're in Luke chapter 7 today, and so you can open to Luke chapter 7. And we'll be starting in verse 36. If you do not have a Bible, the scripture will be on the screen so you can follow along up here. Now, this particular story, um, if you've read the Bible before or you've been in church before, there's a good chance that you have heard this story. The story reads fairly quickly from our point of view, but you have to understand, this story is absolutely shocking, absolutely countercultural. And it would have wreaked havoc in the town. Everybody would have been talking about this story. So let's open up and read the story and see why. Here we go. Luke chapter 7, verse 36. When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet, as she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. So, a Pharisee by the name of Simon, invited Jesus over to his house to dine. Now, the text tells us that when Jesus shows up, what does he do? He goes and reclines at the table. Now, when we read that Bible and that story from our culture, we think, hey, that's a fairly normal situation. Jesus shows up and he goes to the table to have dinner. But here's the thing. This story is powerful because of the things that are not there. You see, in the Middle Eastern culture at the time of Jesus, one of their high important values was the value of hospitality. And when you had a guest over to your house, there are certain things that you did simply to be hospitable to your guest. When they came in the door, they would, you would offer them a place to, see, to sit, and then you would bring water, and you would wash their feet. Now notice, when Jesus comes, do they wash his feet? They don't. Now, that's not the only thing that does not happen, 
Because the other thing, when you had a fancy dinner and a special dinner, when your guests came, you would also have a bowl of anointing oil. And you would anoint your guests as an act of honor, as an act of love, before they came to sit down. None of the traditional means of hospitality are offered to Jesus when he shows up at the house. Now, how many of you have ever gone somewhere where you have felt un? welcomed. Anybody? A lot of us? Think about this. I mean, pretend for a second. If you showed up at my house, and I came to the, you knock on the door, I opened the door, and then I just turned and walked away, how would that make you feel? It'd feel weird, right? You'd be like, wait a second. Am I supposed to be here? What do I do next? You might just kind of come in and try to figure out what you're going to do. But no, good being hospitable, we don't do that, right? If you come to my door, what I hope that I will do is say, hey, welcome, right? I'm so glad you're here. Can I take your coat from you? Let me bring you inside. Hey, would you like to sit on the couch? Would you like to sit at the table? Would you like a cup of coffee? Would you like some water? If I was watching TV, I'm going to turn the TV off, right? If the music was loud, I'll turn the music down. But we do all of these things. Why? Simply to say, welcome. I'm glad that you are here. When Jesus shows up at this house to have a meal with Simon, Jesus is not welcomed. No hospitality. But you see... It's even worse than that. It's not just that he's not welcomed, but in their culture, you know what was so important? Honor and respect. Now, Jesus was a rabbi in his culture, and he is somebody who was to be respected. So when Jesus shows up, what are they saying to Jesus? It is like, it is a clear sign of disrespect to Jesus. Let me, um, when I was studying this passage and researching, I found a quote which was very interesting that helps capture it. But it goes something like this when I can find it. Well, there we go. Here's what one of the authors says. The absence of oils given to Jesus is a bar to the saying of grace. Just as a dirty person is unfit for the temple service, dirty hands are unfit for the saying of grace. So here's what this means. Before they would even pray, right, around the table when they gathered together, you would have to be anointed with oil. You see? When they don't give Jesus oil, they're saying, Jesus, you are not even fit to pray with us. It's a pretty bad scene. But you see, there's a woman in that room. Now, we know this woman as the sinful woman, but why is it she's come to this room to be a part of this dinner? Now, one of perhaps, maybe it's the the idea that stands out, she obviously has come, and she's extremely grateful right? She's very thankful to Jesus. But why is she so thankful? Now, this is one of those things in the text. We don't know that exactly. It doesn't tell us why, but we can definitely guess why. You see, when Jesus was in that town, what did Jesus do at that town? Well, Jesus does what Jesus does. He preaches the good news of Jesus and, or of himself, and the the message that he has is nothing like the people have been hearing from the religious leaders, right? In every town, the religious leaders go around and they say, listen, if you want to be right with God, you need to be more like us. You need to do a better job keeping the rules. You need to do a better job um, being good in all that you do. And perhaps... If you do enough good things, then God will accept you. The 
But see, Jesus is nothing like that. See, Jesus starts showing up, and he starts telling people, guess what? God loves you as you are, not as you should be. God loves you even though by all the markers of your society and your culture, even though they call you a sinner, guess what? God loves you. Remember the story um, when Jesus catches the woman or the woman is caught in adultery? Remember that story? And the people are outside and this woman who's a sinner who is caught in adultery, she's gonna get what she deserves, right? They're all lined up. They're ready to drop stones on her and to stone her. And Jesus shows up to the scene. You remember what Jesus does? He doesn't give her what she deserves, but he just looks around. He says, hey, you know, whoever's without sin, go ahead and throw the first stone. The people start to scatter, and what does Jesus do? He gives grace. He says, is anybody else left here? No. I forgive you. Go live in peace. You see, the woman in the text, we know a couple things about her. Number one, she's a sinner. What does that mean in her society? That means that she is the one who is excluded. She's the one who's pushed out to the side, right? She's the one who's forgotten, okay? And somehow Jesus shows up and she gets the truth that God loves her. So she thinks, man, what can I do to thank Jesus for what he's done for me. So you know what she does? She goes and she gets an alabaster jar of perfume. Now, this particular perfume she would have cost a year's worth of wages. And she shows up at this room to make this offering to Jesus with a perfume that she bought that cost a year's worth of wages. And she stands on the side, which by the way, when they had meals with rabbis in towns and prominent meals, uh, they were actually open right? A lot of meals people could come and observe, so she came and she observed the meal, and she sees Jesus completely insulted and disrespected. But here's the thing, when she sees this to Jesus, she can relate. I mean, that's how people treat her on a regular basis. But when she sees this man, who even though she's been rejected so long, he accepted her, and he loved her, when she sees the disrespect, she's completely, completely broken. And when she sees Jesus, she does the most beautiful thing that has ever happened in the scriptures. She comes to the feet of Jesus, and she gets on her knees. Why? Because she's going to offer Jesus what he was just denied. Now, of course, she's just a sinful woman, so no one's going to come bring her water. So what does she do? She simply gets on her knees, and instead of using water, she uses the tears from her own eyes, and she washes the feet of Jesus. And instead of using a towel, because she wasn't given a towel, she, she lets down her hair, and she takes her hair, and she dries the feet of Jesus. Even that image alone is so beautiful and powerful. But there's more to it. In that culture, if you are a woman in public places, whenever you are anywhere except for in the presence of your husband, you always wear your hair up. You do not let your hair down. And the first time that someone's going to see you, perhaps outside of your parents when you were a child, the first time someone's going to see you with your hair down is on your wedding night after you're married and you will let your hair down. Can you imagine? Jesus gets on, I mean, she gets on her knees. She lets her hair down. This is like a publicly humiliating act for her. But what's the symbolism? What's it saying? Man, in the same way you would give your loyalty and pledge your heart to a spouse, this is what she's doing to Jesus. Like, Lord, I give you my loyalty. I give you my heart. The next thing she does, they didn't bring Jesus oil, but she has the better plan, right? 
She has her perfume, and she takes this beautiful, expensive perfume, and she pours it over Jesus, and she anoints him. It's one of the most incredible moments, I think, that happened in the life of Jesus. Now, of course, if you can imagine with the things that I've said, this moment becomes very interesting, right? I mean, it's, it's awkward. This sinful woman just let down her hair. She just stood up the host of the meal. So what does everybody do? Everybody just sits there in complete silence, right? And they're wondering, okay, what is Jesus going to do now? Is he going to rebuke her? Is he going to ignore her? Is, she gonna, is he going to ask her to get up and leave? And as they're sitting there, Simon, the one who invited Jesus to his house, begins to think something. And we get to see what he's thinking. So here's what Simon thinks in the silence of the moment. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Now, how many of you think this story is beautiful? Some of you. Raise your hand high. Just get a stretch in to keep you awake. All right, there we go. Um, it's an incredible story, right? But look, Simon completely misses it. And why does he miss it? Because Simon is concerned about one thing. You see, in Simon's worldview, and in the worldview at the time, there was a clear division of those who were better than those who were not, right? Here you have Pharisees, you have religious leaders, you have the people doing good things. You have the tithers. You have the people who show up at church every Sunday. You have the people who show up with the best clothes and they look nice and their lives are put together, right? But then there's another class of people. The people down here, the sinners, right? The adulterers. The ones who can't seem to get their lives in order, whose lives keep falling apart. They are the sinners, and here's the problem for Simon. The people up here and the people down here aren't supposed to interact. Because the people up here are clean and righteous before God. The people down here are dirty. And so if somebody up here touches the sinner down here, the sin of the sinner will get on them and it will pollute them. So do you see Simon's logic? He says, wait, if Jesus was a prophet, he would be up here, and he would know better. He would not let a sinful woman touch him. Therefore, Jesus is not up here. Who is Jesus? Jesus is simply a sinner along with the sinners. Everything remains silent. So what does Jesus do? Well, Jesus can read the minds and the thoughts of people. And so he responds to Simon with this. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two people owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii, the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave both debts. Now, which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. And Jesus says, you have judged correctly. Now, the story is fairly simple, right? And the point is obvious. We might think about it this way today. Let's say... Let's say I was taking Dave out to lunch. Dave and I have lunch, and when we're having lunch, I, I was like, oh no, I forgot my wallet. And Dave says, don't worry, I'll take care of it for you. And he saves me $12.50. Now, I'm going to think that's cool of Dave, right? He's a good guy. That was nice of Dave. And 
and I'll be thankful for it, right? A little forgiveness, a little bit of help. So there's that story. But it would be so much different. Let's say you had a house, right? And we've, a lot of us have actually experienced this here. And the housing market crashes and it goes down, right? And all of a sudden, you're living upside down in your home. Your mortgage is way too high, and you're totally strapped. And month after month, you're falling behind. You're falling more behind. But then one day, somebody with a suit and tie knocks on your door. Knock, knock, knock. Hey, who are you? Come on into my house. Would you like some coffee? Would you like some water? Good hospitality. So you invite them in, and they just look at you. They say, listen. We've noticed you're like three months behind on your mortgage. And we also noticed that you lost your job. And there's no way that you're going to be able to pull this off anymore. So here, I noticed that the remaining balance on your note is $300,000. So let me write you a check, $300,000. And just for good length, because you look like you need it, let me add a zero. And then they gave it to you. Now, imagine that moment. That moment would change absolutely everything for you. You'd start to cry. Maybe you'd start to jump in joy. You'd probably give this guy in a suit a big hug. But I'll tell you what, you would be so thankful, right? You would invite him over. You'd throw a party for him. You wouldn't know what to do. Because the reality is, right, the bigger the forgiveness, the higher the grace that we know, right, the greater the response. Now, when a lot of us come here and we simply read this story, we understand the concept of grace and we get what Jesus is saying. But in Simon's worldview, there is no room for grace. It doesn't even make sense to him, you know? Because if you wanted to be right with God, right, there's no way this sinful woman could pull it off. God likes people who do good things, who do the right things. She simply didn't make the cut. And so Simon, even with the story, doesn't understand what's going on. So Jesus then looks at both of them to tell them what's up. Then he turned to the woman and he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and she wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven as her great love has shown but whoever has been forgiven little loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say to themselves, who is this that even forgives sins? Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. The message to Simon is clear, isn't it? This woman knows God's forgiveness. Her life shows it, but your life the things that you've done to me, you show that you have no idea what forgiveness is about. Now, I want you to simply take a second here. Could you imagine being this woman? Every morning, you wake up, and you wake up knowing that you are down here. And because you're down here, when you walk in the streets, people will go to the other side of the street. They won't want to touch you, right? You live down here with very little hope. Why? because you'll never be able to pull off all the right things. It's just too hard. The circumstances of your life will never allow it. And even though you want to go to the temple to offer sacrifices and to say, God, I'm sorry, man, they don't even let you at the temple. Why? Because you are unclean to them. But then all of a sudden, Jesus says, no, actually, when you wake up, you don't need to wake up like you're down here anymore. You're actually, you need to wake up like you're way up here. Here. Why? Because God loves you as you are, not as you should be. Could you just, I mean, could you imagine how her whole life would look different? Can you see how when she began to wake up in the morning, life would be a gift? 
the sun would be a little more beautiful. She began to notice things, right? The awe of her life would begin to come back. That's what God's grace does. You know, I've, I've, been in, I've had a couple conversations like this. I, I literally have probably had this conversation three times in my life, and I can remember them. But each story revolved around a husband and a wife. And the husband was an alcoholic. And the husband fell really, really hard. And the husband would share with me about in his alcoholism, how he was cruel, how he was evil to his wife. And one of the situations, even physical abuse. But then he says, do you know what's crazy? Like even when I was at the, he's like, I remember my lowest point. I was at the bar, even after all I had done to her, and she comes up and she still picks me up. And she brought me home. Now, of course, the beauty of the story is that eventually the husband has this huge wake-up moment, right? But when he looks back on the story with him and his wife, all he can talk about is how shocked he is that she stood by him all this time. And he is absolutely amazed by the grace that she gave him when he did not deserve it. Now think about what this does in a relationship, right? That's a personal experience of grace. But see, this guy says now every time his wife does something for him, in every act of love, in all these moments, right? Guess what? He appreciates every moment is an act of of grace. Everything, right? He doesn't deserve her love, but yet he does it. Okay, so does that make sense, right? That's personal grace. So think about how this works with God then. When grace is personal, when you wake up in the morning and you take your breath, it's not just another breath. It's a gracious act of God who loved you enough to give you a breath, right? When you see the flowers, they're not just flowers. Man, they're creations that God gave you for you to look at and appreciate and enjoy. A gift from God, right? When grace is personal, your life will wake up. And the awe of God will come back in power and in beauty. And it's absolutely incredible. And this woman in the story got it. But there was one in the story who did not get it. Simon the Pharisee, right? Why? Simon couldn't see the beauty of Jesus because he had this big stinking idol right in front of him. The idol was himself, right? He worshiped his own goodness, his own righteousness, and he couldn't see Jesus. And because of his idol, he missed everything that was going on. You see, if Simon looked at his own life, he would have said, I don't need forgiveness. I'm absolutely okay. You know, it's so interesting how we in our own lives can create these different classes of people. We may not say it, but sometimes our actions will show it. You know what I mean? When I was at the gym this morning, I overheard this conversation that just, it broke my heart. Um, so there's this one guy at the gym who's a little different. That's okay, right? But he's a really nice guy. I've talked to him a couple times. And then this other guy I've never seen before was kind of macho. Um, and, and he came in, and, and you could hear this guy talking, and this guy talking over here said, man, look at that guy. Dude, don't listen to him. He's so effed up. And I, 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 I sat there, and I listened. I thought, wait a second. Man, I think we're all a little messed up. You know? See, it's funny. If we evaluate people from a human perspective, just from a human perspective, it's true. 
We might be able to make classes of people and be like, yeah, their sin's a little worse than mine. I've done a lot more good things than they have. And there's some truth to that, right? There's some truth to that from a human perspective. But the thing about it, when we zoom out from a God perspective, God who's perfect and holy in every way, any human being compared to Almighty God, listen, we are all a mess, right? We are all down here. And here's the thing about Jesus. Jesus comes to this earth from up here. He's the only one who's up here. And he doesn't come down here just to be a sinner with the sinners. You know what he does? Jesus comes down and humbles himself to be the savior of all sinners. To give grace, right? So that we could see the beauty and the love of God. See, I love that scripture we read earlier. You know, there's nothing in all of creation that could ever separate us from the love of God. And because of that, when you know it, and you know it in here, every day, When you wake up, it will be a new day. It will be a day that the Lord has made, and the gracious fingerprints of God will be everywhere. Amen. Let's pray. God, we thank you that as you are enthroned in heaven, as you are perfect, as you are righteous, as you are holy, God, when you look down to the people that you made, when you saw how messed up we were, how you saw the misplaced motives of our hearts, the evil things that we do, the things that we think that we not want, not want anyone to know about, God, you didn't just wipe us out. Instead, you said, I need to save these people because I love them. And you came and you were born as a baby. You grew up the perfect sinless life and you gave yourself on a cross to pay for all the messed up things about us, God, so that we could be forgiven and free. Jesus, we just come before you and we say thank you. Lord, we we humbly ask that your grace would not simply be in our minds, but we ask that by your grace, it would be in our hearts, Lord, that grace would be personal to us, so that we could wake up every morning in gratitude for what you've done. If you have never encountered Jesus Christ and you have never put your faith in him, this morning we invite you to do that. Simply come before Jesus and say, God, I am a sinner. There's no way I can save myself but I thank you that you are Savior. And so I ask that you would save me and have mercy on me and make me new again. And if that's you, turn to him and give him your heart. Lord, thank you for what you've done. Thank you for the table that we come to now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.